Well, good morning. Uh, today, as, uh, as Josh was saying, is Mother's Day. And uh, the two most important uh, people in my life to recognize today are my own mother and my wife, Cindy, the mother, of course, of our children. Uh, my mother lives in Manitoba in an assisted living seniors home. I last visited her in February, uh, more than 15 months ago. It's almost incomprehensible that I've not been able to visit her since. Uh, and on a day like this, you think about that. Um, thankfully, we were able to talk on the phone and communicate uh, via email, at least to some extent. But my mother is precious, and I just want to recognize how important she's been in my life. And, and again, that also, I also want to salute uh, Cindy. And, uh, and I want to salute all the mothers that are here, the mothers that are listening online. Uh, thank you for your sacrifices. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your faith. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, we may not be able to gather today due to the pandemic, but our love and respect uh, goes out uh, to all mothers. As we turn to God's word today, I want to start with a, a couple of verses from Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Now we all think and respond differently to situations in life. Uh, some of us are right brain thinkers and some left brain. Uh, some of us make decisions based on feelings and, and some of us on logic. So I'm one of those left brain logic people. I will try to sort through emotional and relational issues using logic. I was listening to a business talk the other day and the speaker said the problem with people is that they aren't logical, they're psychological. And I think only the logical people appreciate that comment. But I will trust my logic as much or perhaps more than my heart. And some of you are just the opposite. So it was about six weeks ago as I was reflecting on, Psalm, on Proverbs 3 in my morning devotionals when I came to verses 5 and 6 and I came to the word trust, trust in the Lord, and I understand that. All right? Then he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And I'm good with that too. I understand the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. But then it says, and do not lean on your own understanding. And I pull up short. Do not lean on your own understanding. I mean, evidently the Proverbs are full of instructions to gain wisdom and understanding. But there comes a time when we must simply trust God and do things his way. A time when our logic and our understanding will not provide all the answers. A time when it will be insufficient. In those situations, we are to acknowledge him. And as we acknowledge him, we are to follow him step by step. And he will straighten the path before us. Or as the psalmist says in Psalm 23, he will lead us in the right paths if we find ourselves on the wrong path. Now, if we aren't to lean on our own understanding, does that mean that our trust and our faith is illogical? Not at all. Faith in the Bible is always determined by its object. In fact, in fact that would be any faith would always be determined by its object. What do we have faith in? It isn't the faith that matters so much as what the faith is in. In fact, I, I, I kind of entitled the, the, the whole theme today, it is not great faith that we need. It is faith in a great God. It isn't so much the faith that matters, but what the faith is in. See, faith we're going to see is like a window. It's not there because we, because we happen to want one wall of, of the room to be made of glass. A window is there so that we can see through it, okay? See through it to see what's on the other side and also to let light to enter into the room. So what is it that we see through the window of faith? Now to answer that, let's go to Isaiah 40. Uh, Isaiah 40, we're spend a little while looking at quite a lot of verses in this chapter. We want to learn a little bit more about faith. And I want to start by going to a passage that is so familiar to some of us that we may not even think clearly about it anymore. I think it would qualify among the favorite texts among Christians. 
And when we read it again, it isn't surprising that it is so popular. Isaiah 40, verse 31. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Awesome stuff. You can read it as poetry or theology. It is inspiring. It is just the sort of thing we need from time to time. In fact, I've heard, uh, being Mother's Day, I've heard many mothers quote this verse over the years, particularly uh, in those uh, younger years with young children, rather wrestling fatigue, feeling faint, feeling drained and weary, not enough sleep. And these verses come up and you just grab hold of them. These verses have often been just what people needed in those kinds of circumstances. In fact, I think at this stage of the pandemic, I think many of us are feeling more like turkeys and eagles. We're walking and not flying. We're weary. We're tired of it all. And so we get inspired by a promise to mount up with wings like eagles, to soar, but then we don't take off. Or we soar briefly, and then we're back to where we were, and I ask, we ask ourselves, what went wrong? But wait, this is verse 31. It's at the end of the chapter. And that's not an accident. This verse, so popular and inspiring, is built on the foundation of what the prophet has been saying before it. But one of the pitfalls of modern Christianity is the attempt to get results without the working. We always try to jump straight to the helpful bit at the end, you know, to find out how we should live. You know, we just want to get to how should we do all of this. And if we can just get there, we're going to be happy. I was thinking about that as Josh was preaching in Ephesians. Many of us love the last half of all of the letters of Paul. Why? Because he tells us how to live. He tells us how to do this stuff. We like the how-to stuff. But Paul never starts with the application. The first half half of his letters are full of the awesome teaching of who is God? Who is Jesus? What has he done for us? Who are we in Christ? And then finally he gets around to the application. The application is powerless without the truth that leads to it. And so we can go back to Isaiah 40 verse 31. How will we make sure we mount up with wings like eagles? Well, we must make sure it really is the Lord that we are waiting on. And we cannot take that for granted. And that's why this part of Isaiah was written. See, Isaiah was writing for people who were trying to face the fact of the exile that God had threatened as punishment on his people for their sin and idolatry. The God that was supposed to be giving all these promises to his promised people is threatening exile, this having to leave the promised land. It wasn't fitting together in their understanding. And many of the things he tells the people about their true God, the God who is so different than their imaginary gods, that they have been worshiping is just this. He says, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of Israel, is the sovereign creator God. He is unique. There is no other God like him. Let's read that. Isaiah 40, we'll start at verse 12. We'll read uh, the next 14 uh, dozen verses or so. Verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket, and they are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol. 
A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in? Who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness? Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you com compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Amen. It's an awesome passage. The creator God is the one who holds the earth as in the hollow of his hand. And he sits enthroned above the rulers of the world, controlling the heavens. He is incomparable. And if you understand that, then there is no sense in trusting any other gods. In fact, there is no sense in trusting in your own understanding apart from God. Verses 18 to 20 compare Israel's powerful God with the so-called gods of the heavens. Whether they are rich, in which case you make gold or silver gods, or poor, in which case you make wooden gods. But the contrast is painfully, painfully acute when you compare the God of the heavens with the man-made gods. So pause for a moment and go up into the heavens. We're invited to, to think about it. This is what the psalmist is, uh, the, rather the author of uh, Isaiah is encouraging us to do. Go up and think about God where he is in the heavens and look down on the earth. Think of all the nations and the kingdoms of the world. God made them all and he rules them all. He allows them to be or he can remove them as he will. Then look down into the shadows of the earth as you peer down. What do you see in the shadows? But people are trying to make their own gods. They're working with gold and silver and wood to fashion their own gods to worship rather than worshiping the creator God. It's ridiculous when you think of it like that. But it is true. It was true at the time of Isaiah and it's true today. Not in the same way, at least not very often do we find people worshiping little golds of silver, gods of gold and silver and wood. We don't usually make little statues like that and worship them, although you can still find that. But idolatry knows no cultural or time boundaries. It's always there. There are those who worship their homes and their cars, their televisions or computer screens. Some of us have well-bound idols in books. You know, we get pride out of them. We put ourselves into them and then we worship what we see. And often we start remaking God into the God we want. We learn something about God that doesn't fit our conception of who God is or what he is like. And so we change who God is in our minds. And so we start worshiping something or someone who is not God. It's someone perhaps that has, is not quite as powerful. Someone that does not get quite as involved in the world events. We start worshiping someone or something that is not God. We might make him more power, uh, more, uh, rather smaller. We might make him less powerful. We might make him less loving or less faithful or less sovereign than he is. My confused desires don't fit in very well with who God actually is. But too often, instead of changing our thinking, we just change who God is. And then we worship that God. 
Who God is matters. Who God is matters. The God with whom you have to do business, whether you want to or not, he matters. And he is so much bigger and greater than anything that I could imagine that I must never imagine him as limited and in a box of my understanding. So when we are down and discouraged and faint and weary, we need to take a harder look at the God of the Bible. We need to study and meditate and reflect on who he is. If we don't, we will gradually start losing our ability to remember him as he is. And we'll start reducing him to something we can live with. And gods that we can live with comfortably are idols. Here in Isaiah, we see the true God and the false gods. The speaking and the dumb gods. The almighty God and the powerless man-made imitation idols. And we must ask the question, which one is it that you worship? Now, this isn't an academic question for Sunday school or just to have a good theology, to pass a test. This is a severely practical matter. The prophet was writing to people who felt let down by their God. They thought because of the situation they were in, because of their understanding of that situation, they thought that the threatened exile meant that God had forgotten them or that he was powerless to help them when they most needed him. What kind of God is it that abandons us in our moment of greatest need? But the truth was exactly the opposite. It was they who had forgotten what their God was like. Their God was too small, which was why Isaiah gave them the tremendous vision of God as the creator and the ruler of heaven and earth. Because this God is not only the sovereign ruler, he is the God who shares his own character with his people. He shares his own character with his people. Verses 28 to 31. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord will, shall renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We're back where we started, but so much richer. God does not grow faint. God does not grow weary. God does not get confused by our situations. His understanding is way beyond ours. Because he does not grow faint, because he does not, because he does not grow faint, it says, he gives power to the faint. Because he does not grow weary, he can ruin you, the strength of those who grow weary. The weary can draw strength from the character of God. God shares his own self. He shares his own mighty power with those who wait on him. Faith by itself is no good. It's popular today to say that, say that you have faith. But what faith in what? Faith in whom? If it's faith in a powerless God, powerless as a block of wood, will that block of wood renew your strength? What matters is the creator God, who is the object of faith. When you look out that window we talked about, that window of faith, what do you see? What kind of light is shining into your life through it? Is it some vague concept of God? Or is it the awesome creator God? But what matters is the object of our faith, God. This is true for every aspect of our lives. The life of a Christian is not something that stands by itself or that props itself up with its own faith and its own understanding. It isn't something we can fabricate or wish into being. At every point, it is based on the character of God, on what God himself, he is like, even in the boring parts of life, especially in the boring parts I might even say, especially in a lockdown, which can be very boring, at least, at least for some of us. For others, it's just an incredibly difficult and stressful time. When life is boring, 
when it is just the same thing over and over again, one foot in front of the other, the steady walk without sudden turnings and interests, then it is not always so easy. That is when we need to know about the God who never faints. God's providence undergirds our perseverance, is what it says. In fact, Paul says the same thing in one of his great blessings, these blessings that Paul sneaks into his letters uh, all over the place. And, and here's one of these blessings. We often use them as benedictions at the end of a worship service. This one's in Colossians 1 verse 11. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Hmm. That blessing is the same blessing as in Isaiah. It's meant for the doldrums of a pandemic. We need endurance and patience with joy. Right? God wants us to have endurance and patience with joy. What's underneath your mask right now? Is there a smile? Is there joy? Can't tell. Your eyes don't give away quite enough. See, Paul makes no bones about it. Being a Christian is hard business. It requires a lot of diligence and, and work. But he says, we have no cause for despair. We can endure and have patience with joy. Because this is God's way of making us into saints because he shares himself with us. What's the secret to this joy and strength? Well, it's, it's right there. It's according to his glorious might. Huh. Not according to how we feel or according to whether we are happy to be doing that particular task that's assigned to us for the moment, okay? We ought to be the happiest, most joyful people in Canada and in the world right now in the midst of the pandemic. We of all people ought to be the happiest people in the middle of the pandemic. We should be the leaders in good attitude. Why? According to his glorious might that he shares with me, I can be strengthened with all power for all endurance and patience with joy. With joy. I will mount up like an eagle with a mask on. Notice the phrase, according to. What does that mean? When you go back to the original Greek, the word was used for something going downstream. Okay, according to the current of the river. The current carries the swimmer along with it. The swimmer can swim too, but with the help of the current, the swimmer can go further and faster and with less effort. Less effort. And so it is in our weakness. We are to swim in the stream of God's almighty power. His almighty power carries us forward. He gives power to the faint. And this brings us back to the beginning. Faith is not a general trust in something or other or someone or other. It's looking at our situation and our own frailty in the light of who God is and what he has done for us. I love the writings of Dallas Willard and he, he talks about how our faith grows according to our vision. Our will to choose God and his ways grows and we become increasingly capable of choosing and doing the good. Faith is like a gift. Faith, is, faith must be received. We, it must be wanted. God doesn't force faith on us. We have to want it. God very, rare, very rarely dumps it on people who do not want it. If you want faith, don't try and invent it or wish it into being. You cannot do it. If you want faith, ask God for it. And when you ask, be willing to let him take you through what is necessary to prepare you for it. Hmm. Job didn't regret what God took him through. Job wanted God. Job wanted to trust God. He persevered and he came out trusting God. He couldn't rely on his own understanding nor the understanding of the wisdom of his friends. He didn't do it. God gave him faith. Because faith is a gift given by God as we are ready. Okay? It comes to us without any kind of strain, no hype, no exaggeration. We simply know, we simply believe. Seek God and ask him to give you the gift of faith. You know when you believe something, you believe that chair will hold you up that you're sitting on right now. 
You believe the sun is going to come up in the morning. You believe in the loyalty of a true friend. You know you believe it. No faking or forcing is necessary. You simply believe it. You also know when you don't believe. So please don't try to believe anything. It does no good. God knows your heart and your mind. Be honest with your doubts. Simply say to God, Lord, give me faith. I am ready for it. Take me through whatever I need for it. So God took the Israelites through exile to learn faith. Whatever it takes. God is sufficient and more in the situation. And he gives us the faith. And as he gives us the faith, we will rise up with wings like eagles. We will walk and not faint in the midst of the challenges of life. Amen.